Mark chapter 4, I'm going to start reading at verse 30, verse 30. Jesus speaking, and notice his language here. It's, it's almost unique how he puts this. He says, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God, or with what parable shall we picture it? What Jesus is saying here is it's, it's almost hard to describe. It's almost hard to, to liken it to something, to picture it, because it's such, a, it's such a comprehensive thing, the kingdom of God. But he goes ahead. He said, it is like a mustard seed, which, when it is sown on the ground, is smaller than all the seeds of the earth. But when it is sown, it grows and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may rest under its shade. Jesus here is speaking about the prodigious potential of the kingdom, his kingdom, known as the kingdom of God, sometimes the kingdom of heaven itself, even though ultimately in heaven, that kingdom will be there forever. Now, when I think of Jesus using that parable of the mustard seed, it makes me think of something that we experienced this year in our own backyard. Uh, many of you know what moon plants, moon flowers are. They're beautiful. They smell great. I have an example of a very withered one. I did not want to pick a good one. So this one, you know, was good yesterday. Now it's gone. But, but I'll tell you what, when these things are in blossom, uh, they're just beautiful. They're, they're pure white. The, the, the scent is wonderful. I found some seeds, not of the moon plant, moonflower seeds. I couldn't find those, so I just found some seeds that Brenda was feeding to the birds. But they're about this small. But let me tell you what. <laughs> this spring... Uh, we had, well, we didn't plant any because we had some last year and they make, they develop these pods and they'll kind of break open and reseed the ground. So as these things began to grow and ours grew kind of late, um, we saw other people who had moonflowers that already blooming and ours are just still developing basically. And Brenda thought they were weeds and she wanted to cut them down. And I said, no, 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 they, they, they just look too good to be weeds. I believe these are, are moonflowers. So finally, she, you know, relented and let me have my way. Well, our backyard has almost been, not the yard, but back where she grows plants and shrubs like that, has almost been overtaken by these things. And they're gorgeous. And Brenda loves every morning to go out with her coffee and sit out there uh, and just smell the flowers. And they're just, but it's just amazing how much they've grown this year. Well, not quite as much as the seed of the kingdom would grow, but that's what Jesus was trying to communicate. And the book of Acts confirms what Jesus was saying about this, the potential of his kingdom to grow. In Acts chapter 4, or, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, on the day of Pentecost, when the apostle Peter and the others initially sowed the seed of the kingdom, about 3,000 souls responded on that first day that they preached and became Christians. In the very last verse of Acts chapter 2, verse 47, it didn't stop there. The Lord added to the church daily. The seed was being spread and people were responding to the gospel. In Acts 4, verse 4, many of those who heard the word believed and the number of men came to be about 5,000. As I said last week, that means the church was probably over 10,000 in number. And this is perhaps less than a month or not much longer than that from the very first day the gospel was preached. Acts chapter 5 and verse 14. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes of both men and women. And then Acts 6, 7. You may remember that from last week. That was the favorite verse of an older retired preacher. Then the word of God spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. The growth of the kingdom and the church in the first century, especially relatively early on, was just breathtaking. It was hard to believe. And what caused all that? Well, the Apostle Paul gives us the answer in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 6 at the end of the verse. He says, God gave the increase. 
It was all about what God was doing. But by what means did God use to bring that increase? Well, that was men. That's where Paul said, I planted Apollos water. I went out sowing a seed. And Apollos would soon follow. And sometimes he would plant extra seed. Or he would encourage those who had heard the gospel to obey the gospel so that they could be on their way to heaven and not on their way to hell. And of course, many, many other early Christians followed suit. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, we read that those who were scattered, scattered away from Jerusalem because they were persecuted, went everywhere. And interestingly enough, it doesn't say they went everywhere searching for some way to survive. No, their first priority as they left Jerusalem was find a way to plant the seed, to talk to others about this Jesus Christ whom they gave their lives to. Acts 12 and verse 24 The Word of God grew and multiplied. Why? Because people were planting the seed. Acts 19.20 So mightily grew the Word of God and prevailed. It was victorious. Why? Because it was being planted. People were planting the seed. And Paul, even when he felt somewhat limited being in chains in a Roman prison, 2 Timothy 2 verse 9 He said, but the word of God is not changed. It's spreading. Spreading like wildfire. Because Christians were spreading. Even in the prison, the apostle Paul was preaching in. He was still planting seeds. And it was spreading. So much so that in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 21, we read that the gospel was preached to every creature under heaven. Every responsible person old enough to respond to the gospel at that point in time heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is amazing. And what makes that even more amazing, incredible, as I mentioned last week, they had no church buildings like we have today. They had little money. In fact, the majority of those Christians were poor. In fact, by our standards, they would have been beneath poverty level. They had no organized personal work programs, no tracts, no brochures, flyers, Bible correspondence courses, nothing like this, no films, no DVDs, videos, projectors, no mass communication, no iPhones, smartphones, iPads, no books, online streaming, no Zoom, no YouTube, no Facebook, nothing like that. And yet they turned the world upside down for Jesus Christ, as indicated in Acts 17, verse 6. They emblazoned Jesus Christ and His gospel across the Roman Empire. Despite all those things that we have today that they couldn't even have dreamed of having. Do you know how much they would have loved having access to an internet back then? But no. So the question I asked last week, how are we doing? I mean, how are we comparing? In all fairness, our situation is different in a few respects. And I'm not talking about all the positives we have going for us. Now, for instance, when the early Christians began to be scattered and began to circulate news about Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ and salvation only through Jesus Christ, I'm guessing once they got away from Jerusalem that about 98% of the people they talked to, they encountered, had never even heard the name Jesus Christ or anything about His kingdom, His church. So when people heard about Jesus, they were fascinated. I mean, this concept, you mean God, this God so loved this world that He gave who? His only begotten Son? I mean, He would do that? Why? For us? Us? And that He would let His Son do what? Suffer and bleed and die. For us? And are you saying he raised him? You mean he came out of his grave after three days? Folks, that was so astonishing to most of those 
initial hearers. We would say it just blew them away. And no wonder. So many of them wanted to hear more. Tell us more about this. We've never heard anything ever like this. You know, a great example of this is found in Acts. In fact, there are a few examples. Let's just look at one. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Acts, the 17th chapter. Acts 17, and I'll start reading at verse 16. And Paul is in Athens now. And what an opportunity he sees. Now, while Paul waited for them, he's waiting for Silas and Timothy, two of his traveling companions at this point in time. At Athens, his spirit was provoked. That idea means it was stirred up within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Everywhere you looked, there were idols. You know, these, these man-made forms and shapes and, and faces and images and animals all over the place. Someone has said you could hardly go through Athens without tripping over an idol. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the Gentile worshippers. So there were Jewish people there and there were Gentile proselytes there. Of course, most if or none of them probably had heard much about Jesus Christ, if anything. So he talked to them, reasoning with them. In the, so he's, he's sharing the gospel. And in the marketplace daily with those who happen to be there. So after he left the synagogue the rest of the week, he'd go into the marketplace and start talking about this one from Nazareth named Jesus. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. These philosophers, the Epicureans were an interesting lot. They were a group of people that basically said this life is all there is, that being the case, eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die. Just do whatever comes to mind because this is all you have. The Stoics, a little more spiritual. Uh, they thought that, yes, this life may be all there is, but they, some of them thought there might be another life, so you better at least live relatively decently. A decent life of moderation. They weren't talking about Christianity. They are just talking about, you know, why, why live in moral depravity? Just be a good example. Try to, try to be a positive influence in this world. The Stoics, the porch philosophers. All right. Or for, from the porch philosopher. Well, we, that's another story. All right. And some said, what does this, speaking of Paul, what does this babbler want to say? Others said he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him. Now, they didn't arrest him, but they, they basically said, all right, come with us, please, to the Areopagus, a special, special place where a lot of famous speeches were made, by the way, saying, may we know what this new doctrine of which you speak all right? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Again, they'd never heard of anything like this. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent time, their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. And this is the newest thing, maybe the most unique thing they'd ever heard. And then you go down verse 32 of Acts 17. And when they, those who are listening, heard of the resurrection of the dead, that was a very unique notion. Some mocked. They probably said, all right, Paul, we follow you up to this point, but we, we can't deal with that. I'm sorry. While others, this is the good soil. Others said, we will hear you again on this matter. We want to learn more about this Jesus, about this resurrection, and about getting to heaven? Oh, yes. Now, here's my point. As these early Christians planted the seed of the kingdom, they typically encountered virgin soil, which means they did not have to spend weeks or months or years combating, refuting erroneous doctrines connected with Christ or His kingdom, the church. 
In other words, there was no Catholicism, no denominations, no cults connected with Christianity, at least not for decades after this. And as almost any missionary would tell you, the most receptive people on earth are those who have heard little or nothing about Jesus Christ and his kingdom and his church. Now, today, it's different. To the contrary, much of the soil in our community and around our country and most parts of the world contains, let me change that, is tainted contaminated, if you will, by false notions, false doctrines, false practices. And many people around us who've grown up believing, and I'm not saying everything they believe is wrong. Some of the things they believe are very correct. But some of what they believe, being wrong, are very hesitant then to listen to anything else. It's hard to go against what you believe since you were a small child. Some people will, but many people find that very, very hard to do. So we do have a situ different situation today because when we talk to people about the gospel of Jesus Christ, sometimes we have to correct notions about the gospel that they have and are, have been convinced of that are not totally accurate, some of them very, very wrong. But that's not all. We are also encountering, as a brotherhood, a growing prejudice against the Lord's church. Let me explain. If you go back 60 years, what would that be, 62? If you went around to your neighbors, knocked their door, and said, listen, I'm a member of the Church of Christ, they, many of them would say, what? Church of Christ? Yes. Oh, what denomination is that? It's not. It's, it's non-denominational. We're not part of a, any denomination. A lot of people would find that very curious, and they would, oh, well, tell me about that. I hadn't heard about that. Now there are some who'd say, yeah, I've heard a little bit about the Church of Christ. Isn't that the church that doesn't use instruments when they worship? Something like that. But a lot of people would be curious. It's not quite the same today, 2022. Increasing numbers, if you would ask them, and if they'd be honest with you, would say this, Church of Christ? Oh, yeah. I've been told about the Church of Christ. I've been warned about the Church of Christ. Some people would say, the Church of Christ is nothing but a cult. You're so similar to the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons. And many are led to believe that. Listen, just recently, I heard two well-known radio personalities, one who has a nationwide audience, I don't know how many, I'm going to guess at least 10 to 12 million, both of which warn their listeners against the Church of Christ. Both calling it a cult. Both calling its members brainwashed. No, you'd never heard that 60 years ago, but you'll hear more of that today. I know three families in this area who are hesitant to even visit our services because they have been told convincingly that boy, once they get you in there, they've got you. They will brainwash you. They will teach you all. They will teach you salvation by works only. They'll teach you that we're, we're saved by baptism without even the need of faith. Ridiculous ideas. But ideas which a lot of people hear and they just accept as truth. We have to combat that today. And it's not easy to do sometimes. Be that as it may, we cannot allow any of that to deter us from preaching the truth, from planting the seed. After all, is the Great Commission not still in force? Don't Jesus, or do not Jesus' words still apply? Mark 16, 15, 16, go into all the world. That wasn't limited to the apostles or those early Christians. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Don't we still have that? Yes, yes we do. And moreover, there are still countless lost souls around us. And many of them searching for truth. 
Now, I admit that many people in this area, if you were to talk to them or knock on their door, uh, they would have no interest in hearing anything about the gospel or about the Lord's church or about the kingdom of God. But there are some who will listen. If we would be willing to share. Do you know if only one in 20 people that you ever meet, if only one in 25% of all the people you ever encounter, if just that small minority would be willing to at least listen to you, do you know that represents just under 14 million people who might really be willing to listen? Jesus said something about that. John 14, 35. He says, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Jesus wasn't saying, look at all the Jews are already. No. But he knew there were Jews out there who would listen. Matthew 9, 37. He says, the harvest truly is plentiful. There are souls out there that will listen. And then he added, but the laborers, are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus was asking those disciples to pray for us because there's never been a greater need. Now, all that said, what's the difference between the early Christians who vigorously, enthusiastically, passionately shared the gospel and us. That'll be the subject of the next two lessons because there's at least four differences. I'll give you a hint. And tonight, I'm going to continue this tonight. Uh, or I'll, I could finish it now, but it require at least another 25 minutes and I would not keep you here that long. But listen, I'll give you two, two just to introduce the points. Number one, We'll talk more tonight, God willing. They took the Great Commission a little more seriously than many Christians do today. Number two, the second difference. Many of them were dirt poor. Dirt poor. And you might say, what does that mean? have to do, I mean, obviously, most of us are not dirt poor. We get that. But what does that have to do with them so passionately spreading the gospel? We'll see tonight. I hope you can come back. Let's just have a prayer to finish this lesson. Our Father in heaven, thank you again for everyone who's chosen to come here today. Many came to study in our Bible classes, and thank you so much for Leary's class on Revelation and fascinating points he made. But thank you for all who also came to extend to you our praise, our attention, our focus. Thank you for the prayers that have been prayed this morning thus far, the comments made. And thank you for the privilege I have of examining what your early followers did and Help us to see more clearly the differences. And we know it is a different world. And we know sometimes we're fighting an uphill battle, especially today. But the last command of your son to go into the world is still ours. Give us the courage, the, the opportunity, and certainly the means to do that. Help us all to realize all those people without Jesus Christ are lost. And we may be the only hope to bring the good news. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for, for being so good to us, Father. Bless those and help those who are not right with you, those certainly who have never given their lives to Jesus, that even this day, based on their faith and willingness to change, that they'll be baptized into Christ and become Christians. And we pray for souls who are struggling spiritually, who've gotten off the road to heaven, that they might 
let us know so we can pray and encourage them and help them to get back on the road. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray these things. Amen. If the invitation this morning touches you and you need to respond, you can come up and have a seat up here and we'd be more than happy to assist you. If you need to come, would you do so as we now stand and sing this song of invitation?